what are the classical pieces of what apology or classical verses that shares what apologetics is is first peter three fifteen, mm. where it says to give reason for the hope that is in you that reason doesn't need to be just an intellectual argument that reason can also be hey this works in my life and like you said relationally this has healed me this is how i've experienced human flourishing this is what i've been longing for i've finally been satisfied it actually christianity has the means and the solutions to my problems yeah you know admittedly i've kind of had a love-hate relationship with this approach i'm not mm. sure if i've really shared this with you before <laughs> but like something isn't true because it makes us feel good and you know mm -hmm. that um, and for me, it's like, I tend to live maybe more in my head than a lot of people. Um, and so I kind of have to keep telling myself we are not just thinking beings, mm. but for me, it's like, I really want to just live in this space of like, let's argue this out or let's look through the logical reasons. Let's ar like talk about the syllogisms and all this stuff, like the, the reasons why we can believe Christianity yeah. is true, be logical, be rational, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think that that is imperative for Christianity to be true. And, and some of the other stuff, like whether it feels good or those other concerns we have are kind of irrelevant in some ways. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I get it. We go there because this is the kind of frequency that our culture is tuned into right now. Yeah. And so if we're going to reach them, if we're going to have an audience and ever be able to get them to even listen to the reasons why we can trust Christianity, mm -hmm. like, yeah, we've got to we've got to persuade them that Christianity is worth listening to. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the entry point nowadays where it might not just be truth and rationality because people can always deny facts. And I think the, we may think we're really, really rational beings, but we are deeply emotional beings. Mm -hmm. We believe in things. We follow things. We put our trust in things to satisfy us. And a lot of times we make our decisions not by what we think, but by what we believe. And there is a deep heart knowledge that we put our hope and our trust in things. We don't just think things. Therefore, while thinking is important, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm talking in a circle. <laughs> but well, I, I think I get where you're trying to land this plane. I yeah. Mean, it's like we, we can't, we can't just cut out all these other other yeah now i'm getting tongue-tied <laughs> we can't just cut out all these other parts of the human person yeah. and expect mm -hmm. that we're going to have a complete holistic message for someone mm -hmm. by just appealing to their rational side mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah and i would venture to say that the majority of people come to faith in christ not because of thinking rationally mm -hmm. or doing the research Think about the number of people converting overseas, the Middle East, and it's because Jesus is showing up to them mm -hmm. in, in dreams. Yeah. That's not all that rational. It's like I saw Jesus and I experienced his love and that drew me in. Or you think about the number of people who um, it's they're longing for something like they're afraid of going to hell. And so they place their faith in Christ. They're longing for a father. Mm -hmm. They're uh, wanting love. They're wanting acceptance. And there's all these aspects of the human heart that draws somebody to Christ. And also, you know, Jesus said, nobody comes to the father unless the father draws yeah. them. And so there is just this divine draw and pull and engaging with our emotions and feelings that, mm -hmm. that God uses to bring people to himself. One of the first times I saw witness to this and began to realize it is in Josh McDowell's story and where he shares his testimony that he had strong objections to the Christian faith. He didn't think it was credible. He thought, man, how in the world could you believe in that stuff? But then actually doing the research, finding things like he was an agnostic, so he believed there was a God exists, but that the Bible was reliable, that Jesus lived, he died on the cross and he rose from the grave. He's like, all that stuff convinced me it was true. But when he realized that if he was the only person alive today that Christ still would have died for him, that's what led him to surrender. 
So I've heard a lot of people say the greatest apologetic is love. It's love, where it's the kindness of God that draws us to repentance. We can believe that God exists. We can believe the Bible's reliable, but it becomes personable and personal when we realize, whoa, this God actually loves me. He sees me, he knows me fully, and he loves me. And he desires a relationship with me. That's what I was created for. Yeah, I've always... I always find it kind of funny that Josh shares, though, how like when he first accepted Christ, when he that moment when he prayed the prayer or accept allowed Jesus to enter into his life, that moment, um, he often says like at that moment I wanted to throw up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I um I suspect the reason is because all of this rationality was there, and he realized like that truth itself demands our attention. He had no other option but to accept Jesus Christ. And he was already starting to see some of these things, like the goodness of the gospel so forth. Mm-hmm. But clearly there was some stuff that he still didn't like, stuff he was concerned about, like what would my friends say and so forth. And um, and so it's like uh, good on him for allowing truth to have its way and yeah. to follow it wherever it takes him. Um, but hopefully, you know, for this next generation that we can – get to a point where they're accepting Christ without wanting to throw up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So one of the things that I think we can do to help people in apologetics bridge this gap between just having rational arguments to emotionally experiencing what this stuff means for our lives, we have to help people realize behind a lot of these logical arguments, there is deep emotional implications for us. So let's help connect the head to our heart. What does it mean that the universe had a cause, that there is something outside of what we can see, touch, and feel? There is something transcendent above this that caused it all to happen. Mm -hmm. There is emotional weight to that, that there is something out there that created personal conscious beings, therefore they must be personal personal and conscious. That means there's something out there bigger than what we can see. And I think that is emotional weight. So helping connect the intellectual arguments to the emotion that it actually, how, we, how do we experience those things? Yeah, and maybe even to add to that, oftentimes as apologists, we have to be careful with some of these rational arguments because uh, think of somebody who maybe grew up in the church, was abused by the church, mm. and their whole life they felt that abuse, but they also witnessed that Christianity was very like irrational, like a lot of these people weren't thinking clearly, and da, da, da. And so then like I'm coming up to them and I'm using these like sophisticated lo- deductive arguments, like the mm. cosmological argument to show that that um, the universe you know has a cause and that cause is God because of this and that reason. At, at this point, what I've done is I've, I've taken away from them this comfort, this cushion they've had to shield themselves from abusive Christianity, um, which is that these Christians aren't thinking clearly anyway to begin with, so I don't mm. need to allow that to affect me. I've mm. taken that away from them. Like, I need to be careful about, you know, where I'm leaving them because I, if, am I, am I able to hold them in this new space? Like, mm. uh, this this um, handicap, this emotional thing, whatever what we want to call it, that has helped them carry on through life, mm-hmm. this belief in the, the atheistic or skeptic narrative mm-hmm. that I'm now starting to pull out from under them. Like, are they ready to even be in that space to consider this and think this? That, mm-hmm. that can be a little hard if we're not um, cognizant of, of how they are responding emotionally to what we're doing in apologetics. Mm-hmm.